The speaker's voice was as loud as empty beer trucks in a stone street. And the people at the meeting were jammed up close, cobblestones, that great voice booming over them. Taviri was somewhere on the other side of the hole. She had to get to him. She wormed and pushed away among the dark clothes, clothes packed people. She did not hear the words nor see the faces. Only the booming and the bodies pressed one behind the other. She could not see Taviri. She was too short. A broad, black-vested belly and chest loomed up, blocking her way. She must get through to Taviri. Sweating, she jabbed fiercely with her fist. It was like hitting stone, and he did not move at all. But the huge lungs let out right over her head, a prodigious noise, a bellow. She cowered. Then she understood that the bellow had not been at her. Others were shouting. The speaker had said something, something fine about taxes and shadows. Thrilled, she joined the shouting, Yes! Yes! And shoving on, came out easily into the open expanse of the regimental drill field in Pahel. Overhead, the evening sky lay deep and colorless, and all around her nodded the tall weeds with dry, white, clothes floretted heads. She had never known what they were called. The flowers nodded above her head, swaying in the wind that always blew across the fields in the dusk. She ran among them, and they whipped lie the side and stood up again, swaying silent. And Taviri stood among the tall weeds in his good suit, the dark gray one that made him look like a professor or a play actor, harshly elegant. He did not look happy, he was laughing and saying something to her. The sound of his voice made her cry, and she reached out to catch hold of his hand. But she did not stop quite. She could not stop. The queer smell of the white weeds was heavy as she went on, and there were thorns, tangles underfoot, and there were slopes, pits. She feared to fall. To fall, she stopped. And she awoke. Sun, bright, morning glare straight in the eyes relentless she forgot to pull back the blind last night she turned her back on the sun but the right side wasn't comfortable no use day she sighed twice sat up got her legs over the edge of the bed and sat hunched in her nightdress looking down at her feet the toes compressed by a lifetime of cheap shoes are almost square where they touched each other and bulged out above in corns The nails were discolored and shapeless, and between the knob-like ankle bones ran fine, dry wrinkles. And the brief little plane at the base of the toes had kept its delicacy, but the skin was the color of mud, and knotted veins crossed the instep. Disgusting, sad, depressing, mean, pitiful. She tried on all the words, and they all fit like hideous little hats. Hideous. Yes, that one, too. To look at oneself and find it hideous. <laughs> what a job. But then, when she hadn't been hideous, when she had sat around and stared at herself like this, never. A proper body is not an object, not an implement, not a belonging to be admired. It's just you, yourself. Only when it's no longer you, but yours, a thing owned, do you worry about it. Is it in good shape? Will it do? Will it last? Who cares? It made her giddy to stand up suddenly. She had to put on her hand to the bed table, for she dreaded falling. At that, she thought of reaching out to Taviri in the dream. What had he said, she couldn't remember. She was not sure if she had even touched his hand, and she frowned, trying to force memory. It had been so long since she had dreamed about Taviri, and now not even to remember what he said. It was gone. It was gone. She stood there, hunched in her nightdress, frowning one hand on that bed table. How long was it since she had thought of him, let alone dreamed of him? Even thought of him as Taviri. How long since she had said his name? Aseo said, when Aseo and I were in prison in the north before I met Aseo. Aseo's theory of reciprocity. Oh yes, she talked about him. Talked about him too much, no doubt. Maunder dragged him in. But as Aseo, the last name, the public man, the private man, was gone. 
utterly gone. There were so few left that even knew him. They had all used to be in jail. One laughed about it in those days, all the friends and all the jails. But they weren't even there these days. They were in the prison cemeteries or in the common graves. Oh, my dear. Leia said out loud, and she sank down onto the bed again because she could not stand up under the remembrance of those first weeks in the fort. In the cell. Those first weeks of nine years in the fort and Drio. In the cell. Those weeks after they told her that Aseo had been killed in the fighting in Capitol Square and had been buried in the 1400s in the lime ditches behind Oring Gate. In the cell. Her hands fell into the old position on her lap. The left clenched and locked inside the grip of the right. The right thumb working back and forth, a little pressing and rubbing on the knuckle of the left first finger. Hours, days, nights. She had thought of them all, each one, each one of the fourteen hundred, and how they lay, how the quick lime worked on the flesh, how the bones touched in burning dark, and who touched him. How did the slender bones of the hand lie now? Hours, years. Kaviri, I haven't forgotten you. She whispered, and the stupidity of it brought her back to morning light and the rumpled bed. Of course she hadn't forgotten him. These things go without saying between a husband and a wife. There were her ugly old feet, flat on the floor again just as before. She had not gotten nowhere at all. She had gone in a circle. She stood up with a grunt of effort and disapproval and went to the closet for a dressing gown. The young people went about the halls of the house, and becoming immodesty, but she was too old for that. She didn't want to spoil some young man's breakfast with the sight of her. Besides, they had grown up in the principle of freedom of dress and sex and all the rest, and she had not. All she had done was invented, and that's never the same. Like speaking of Osseo as my husband, they winced. The word she should use as a good Odonian, of course, was partner, but... Why did she have to be a good Odonian? And she shuffled down the hall to the bathroom. Myra was there, washing her hair in the lavatory. Leia looked at the long, sleek, wet hank with admiration. She got out of the house so seldom now, she didn't know when she was last respectably shaven. But still, the sight of her full head of hair gave her pleasure. Vigorous pleasure. How many times... Had she been jeered at, long hair, long hair, had her hair pulled by policemen or young toughs, had her hair shaved off down to the scalp by a grinning soldier at each new prison, and they had grown it all back over again, from the fuzz to the frizz to the curls to the mane, in the good old days. For God's love, couldn't she think of anything today but the good old days? Dressed, her bed made, she went down to the commons. It was a good breakfast, but she had never got her appetite back since the stroke. She drank two cups of herb tea, but couldn't finish the piece of fruit that she had taken. How she had craved fruit as a child badly enough to steal it, and in the fort. Oh, for God's love, stop it. She smiled and replied to the greetings and friendly inquiries of the other breakfasters and Big Ivy, who was serving the counter this morning. It was he who attempted her with the peach. Look at this, I'm saving it for you. And how could she refuse? Anyway, she had always loved fruit. and never got enough. Once when she was six or seven, she had stolen a piece off a vendor's cart in River Street, but it was hard to eat when everyone was talking so excitedly. There was news from Thu. Real news. She was inclined to discount it at first, being wary of enthusiasms, but after she had read between the lines of it, she thought with a strange kind of certainty, deep but cold, why this is it. It has come. And in Thu, not here, Thu will break this country. The revolution will prevail first there. As if that mattered, there will be no more nations. And yet it did matter somehow. It made her a little cold and sad and envious, in fact. 
Of all the infinite stupidity, she did not join in the talk much and soon got up to go back to her room, feeling sorry for herself. She could not share their excitement. She was out of it. Really, out of it. It's not easy, she said to herself in justification, laboriously climbing the stairs to accept being out of it when you've been in it, in the center of it for 50 years. Oh, for God's love, the whining. She got the stairs and the self-pity behind her, entering her room. It was a good room. It was good to be by herself. It was a great relief. Even if it wasn't strictly fair, some of the kids in the attics were living five to a room no bigger than this. There were always people wanting to live in an Odonian house that could properly be accommodated. She had this big room, all to herself, only because she was an old woman who had had a stroke, and maybe because she was Odo. If she hadn't been Odo, but merely the old woman with a stroke, would she have it? Very likely, after all, who wanted to room with a drooling old woman? But it was hard to be sure. Favoritism, elitism, leader worship, they crept back and cropped out everywhere. But she had never hoped to see them eradicated in her lifetime, in one generation. Only time works the great changes. Meanwhile, this was a nice, large, sunny room, proper for a drooling old woman who had started a world revolution. Her secretary would be coming in in an hour to help her dispatch the day's work. She shuffled over to the desk, a beautiful big piece, a present from Noy Cabinet Maker Syndicate because somebody had heard her remark once that the only piece of furniture she had ever really longed for was a desk with drawers and enough room on top. Uh, The top was practically covered with papers with notes clipped to them, mostly in Noy's small clear handwriting. Urgent. Northern provinces. Consult with R.T. Her own handwriting, that is, had never been the same since Haseo's death. It was odd when you thought about it. After all, within the five years after his death, she had written the whole analogy. And there were those letters which the tall guard with the watery grew eyes. What was his name? Uh, Never mind. Had smuggled out of the fort for two years in. The prison letters, they were now called, and there were a dozen different editions of them. All that stuff, the letters which people kept telling her were so full of spiritual strength, which probably meant she had been lying herself blue in the face when she wrote them, trying to keep her spirits up. And the analogy, which was certainly the solidest intellectual work she had ever done, all that had been written in the Ford and Rio, in the cell, after Aseo's death. One had to do something, and in the fort, they let one have paper and pens, but it had all been written in a hasty, scribbling hand she had never felt was hers, not her own, like the round, black scrolling of the manuscript of Society Without Government, 45 years old. Taviri had taken not only her body and her heart's desire to the quick climb with them, but even her good, clear handwriting. But he had left her the revolution. How brave of you to go on, to work, to write, in prison, after such a defeat for the movement, after your partner's death, people used to say. Fools. What else was there to do? Bravery, courage, what was courage? She had never figured it out. Not fearing, some said. Fearing yet going on, others said. But what could one do but go on? Had one any real choice ever? To die was merely to go on in another direction. And if you wanted to come home, you had to keep going on. And that's what she meant when she wrote The True Journey is Return. But it had never been more than an intuition, and she was farther ever now from being able to rationalize it. She bent down, to suddenly that she grunted a little at the creak in her bones and began to root in a bottom drawer of the desk. Her hand came on the aid softened folder and drew it out, recognizing it by touch before sight confirmed. The manuscript of Syndical Organization and Revolutionary Transition. She had printed the title on the folder and written his name on it. Taviri Odo Aseo. There was an elegant handwriting, every letter well formed, bold, fluent. But he had preferred to use a voice printer. The manuscript was on his voice print, and high quality too. 
Hesitancies adjusted, idiosyncrasies of speech normalized. He couldn't see how he had said oh deep in his throat as they did on the north coast. There was nothing of him but his mind. She had nothing of him at all except his name written on the folder. She hadn't kept his letters. It was sentimental to keep letters. Besides, she never kept anything. She couldn't think of anything that she had ever owned for more than a few years. Except this ramshackle old body, of course. She was stuck with that. Dualizing again. She and it. Age and illness had made one a duelist. Made one escapist. The mind insisted, it's not me, it's not me, but it was. Maybe the mystics could detach mind from body. She had hoped to always rather wistfully envy them the chance without hope emulating them. Escape had never been her game. She had sought for freedom here, now, body and soul, first self-pity, then self-praise, and here she still sat, for God's love holding Aseo's name in her hand, and why didn't she know his name without looking it up? What was wrong with her? She raised the folder to her lips and kissed the handwritten name firmly and squarely, replaced the folder on the back of the bottom drawer, shut the drawer, and straightened up in the chair. Her right hand tingled. She scratched it, and then shook it in the air spitefully. It had never quite got over the stroke. Neither had the right leg or right eye or the right corner of her mouth. They were sluggish and apt, and they tingled. They made her feel like a robot with a short circuit, and time was getting on. Noi would be coming. What had she been doing ever since breakfast, anyway? She got up so hastily that she lurched and grabbed at the chair back to make sure she didn't fall. She went down the hall to the bathroom and looked in the big mirror. Her gray knot was loose and droopy. She hadn't done it up well before breakfast, and she struggled with it a while. It was hard to keep her arm in the air, and Amai came running in, stopped and said, Oh, let me do it knotted it right up tight and neat in no time, with her round, strong, pretty fingers smiling and silent. Amai was twenty, less than a third of Leia's age. Her parents had both been members of the movement, one killed in the insurrection of sixty, the other still recruiting in the southern provinces, and Amai had grown up in an Adonian house, born of the revolution, a true daughter of anarchy, and so quiet and free and beautiful a child, enough to make you cry when you thought about it, that this is what we worked for, this is what we meant, this is it, here she is, alive, the kindly, lovely future, and Leia Haseodo's right eye wept several little tears as she stood between the lavatories and latrines, having her hair done up by the daughter she had not born, but her left eye, the strong one, did not weep nor did it know what the right eye did. She thanked Amai, hurried back to her room. She had noticed in the mirror a stain on her collar, peach juice probably, old dribbler. She didn't want Noi to come in and find her with drool on her collar. And the clean shirt went over her head, she thought, what's so special about Noi? She fastened the collar frogs with her left hand slowly. Noi was 30 or so, a slight, muscular fellow with a soft voice and alert dark eyes. Ah, that's what was special about Noi. It was that simple. Good old sex. She had never been drawn to a fair man or a fat one or the tall fellows with big biceps. Never. Not even when she was 14 and fell in love with every passing fart. Dark, spare, and fiery, that was the recipe. Tveri, of course. And this boy wasn't a patch on Tveri for brains, nor even for looks. But uh, there it was. She didn't want him to see her dribble on her collar and her hair coming undone. Her thin, gray hair. Noi came in, just pausing in the open doorway. My God, she hadn't even shut the door while changing her shirt. She looked at him and saw herself the old woman. You could brush your hair and change your shirt, or you could wear last week's shirt and last night's braids, or you could put on cloth of gold and dust, your shaven scalp with diamond powder. None of it would make the slightest difference. The old woman would look a little less or a little more grotesque. 
One keeps oneself neat at a mere decency, mere sanity, awareness of other people, and finally even that goes and one dribbles unashamed. Morning, the young man said. Hello, Noy. No, by God, it was not out of mere decency, decency be damned, because the man she loved and to whom her age would not have mattered, because he was dead, must she pretend that she had no sex? Must she suppress the truth like a Puritan authoritarian? Even six months ago, before the stroke she had made, men look at her and like to look at her, and now, though she could give no pleasure, by God, she could please herself. And when she was six years old, and Papa's friend Gadeo used to come by to talk politics with Papa after dinner, she would put on the gold-colored necklace that Mama had found on a tree sheep. It was so short that it always got hidden under a collar where she used it. She liked it that way. Oh, what? My head's dull. I had a terrible night. It was true. She had slept even less than usual. I was asking if you'd seen the papers this morning. She nodded. Pleased about Soinahi? Soinahi was the province in Thu that had declared succession from the Thubian state last night. He was pleased about it. His white teeth flashed in the dark, alert face. Yes, and apprehensive. I know, but it's the real thing this time. It's the beginning of the end of the government in Thu. They haven't even tried to order troops into Soinahi, you know. It would merely provoke the soldiers into rebellion sooner, and they know it. She agreed with him. She herself had felt that certainty, but she could not share his delight. After a lifetime of living on hope because there is nothing but hope, one loses the taste for victory. A real sense of triumph must be preceded by real despair. She had unlearned despair a long time ago, and there were no more triumphs. One went on. Shall we do those letters today? All right, which letters? The people in the north, in the north, Parheo and Odun. She had been born in Parheo, the dirty city on the dirty river. And she had not come here to the capital till she was 22 and ready to bring the revolution. Though in those days, before she and the others had thought it through, it had been a very green and puerile revolution. Strikes for better wages, representation for women, votes and wages, money and power, Oh, for the love of God, will one dunce learn a little after all in fifty years? And then, one must forget it all. Start with Odun, she said, sitting down in the armchair. Noy was at the desk ready for work. He read out excerpts from the letters she was to answer. She tried to pay attention and succeeded well enough that she dictated one whole letter and started another. Remember... That at this stage, your brotherhood is vulnerable to the threat of... No, to the danger to... She groped till Noy suggested the danger of leader worship. All right. And that nothing is so soon corrupted by power-seeking as altruism. And no, that doesn't corrupt altruism. No, oh, for God's love, you know what I'm trying to say, Noy, you... Write it. They know it, too. It's just the same old stuff. Why can't they just read my books? Noy said gently, smiling, citing one of the central Odonian themes. Touch. All right, but I'm tired of being touched. If you'll write the letter, I'll sign it. I can't be bothered with it this morning. There's, there's something else I have to do. And when Noy had gone... She sat down at the desk and moved the papers about, pretending to be doing something because she had been startled, frightened by the words she had said. She had nothing else to do. She never had anything else to do. This was her work, her life work. The speaking tours and the meetings and the streets were out of reach for her now. But she could still write, and that was her work. And anyhow, if she had kept anything else to do, Noy would have known it. She kept her schedule and tactfully reminded her of things, like the visit from the foreign students this afternoon. She liked the young. There was always something to learn from a foreigner, but 
she was tired of new faces and tired of being on view. She learned from them, but they didn't learn from her. They learned all they had to teach from long ago, from her books, from the movement. They just came to look as if she were the great tower or the canyon in Tulave, a phenomenon, a monument. They were awed, adoring. She snarled at them. Think your own thoughts. That's not anarchism. That's mere obscuritarianism. You don't think liberty and discipline are incompatible, do you? And they accepted their tongue lashing meekly as children, gratefully as if they were some kind of all mother, the idol of a big sheltering womb. She, who had mined the shipyards in Cicero, who had screeched and sworn and kicked policemen, spat at priests, and peed in public on the big brass plaque in Capitol Square that had said, here was founded the sovereign nation, etc., etc., soul to that. And now, she was everybody's grandmama, the dear old lady, the sweet old monument, come worship at the womb, the fire's out Boys, it's safe to come close. Now, Leia said out loud, I will not. She was not self-conscious about talking to herself, because she always had talked to herself. Leia's invisible audience, Tavari had used to say as she went through the morning, muttering in the room, You needn't come, I won't be here. She told the invisible audience now, she had just decided that it was she that had to go out. She had to go out, to go into the streets. It was inconsiderate to disappoint the foreign students. It was erratic, typically senile. It was unadonian. But to all that, what was the good working for freedom all your life and ending up without any freedom at all? She would go out for a walk. What is an anarchist? One who, choosing, accepts the responsibility of choice. On the way downstairs, she decided, scowling to stay and see the foreign students. But then, she would go out. There were very young students, very earnest, doe-eyed, shaggy, charming creatures from the Western Hemisphere. Binbilly, in the kingdom of man. The girl in white trousers, the boy in long kilts, warlike and archaic. And they spoke of their hopes. We in man are so very frightened from the revolution that maybe we are near it, said one of the girls, wistfully and smiling. The circle of life, after all. And she showed the extremes meeting in the circle of her slender, dark-skinned fingers. And Amai and Avi served them white wine and brown bread, the hospitality of the house. But the visitors, unpresumptuous, all rose to take their leave with barely half an hour. No, no, no. Leia said, Stay here. Talk with Avi and Amai. It's just that I get stiff sitting down, you see. I have to change about. And so good to meet you. Will you come back to see me, my little brothers and sisters, soon? For her heart went out to them, and theirs to her, and she exchanged kisses all around, laughing delighted by the dark young cheeks, the affectionate eyes, the scented hair. Before she shuffled off, she was really very tired. But to go up and take a nap would be a defeat. She had wanted to go out. She would go out. She had not been alone outdoors since... When? Since winter? Uh, before the stroke. No wonder she was getting morbid. It had been a regular jail sentence outside the streets. That's where she lived. She went quietly out the side door of the house, past the vegetable patch to the street. The narrow strip of sour city dirt had been beautifully gardened and was producing a fine crop of beans, but Leia's eye for farming was an unenlightened one. Of course, it had been clear that anarchist communities, even in the time of transition, must work toward optimal self-support. But here, how? Was that to be managed in the way of actual dirt and plants? It wasn't any of her business. There were farmers for that. Her job was the streets. 
the noisy, stinking streets of stone where she had grown up and lived all her life except for the 15 years in prison. She looked up fondly at the facade of the house that it had always been built as a bank gave peculiar satisfaction to its present occupants. They kept their sacks of meal in the bomb-proof money vault and aged their cider in kegs and safety deposit boxes. And over the fuzzy columns that faced the street-carved letters still read, National Investors and Grain Factors Banking Association. The movement was not strong on names. They had no flags. Slogans came and went as the need did. There was always the circle of life to scratch on walls and pavements where authority would have to see it. But when it came to names, they were indifferent. Accepting and ignoring whatever they got called. Unafraid of being pinned down and pinned in. Unafraid of being absurd. So this best known and second oldest of all the cooperative houses had no name except the bank. It faced on a wide and quiet street. But only a block away began the Tamiba, an open market once famous as a center for black market psychogenics and teratrinics. Now reduced to vegetables, secondhand clothes, and miserable sideshows, its vitality was gone, leaving only half paralyzed alcoholics, addicts, cripples, hucksters, and fifth rate whores, pawn shops, gambling dens, fortune tellers, body sculptors, and cheap hotels. And Leia turned to the Tamiba as water seeks its level. And she had never feared or despised the city. It was her country. There would be no slums like this if the revolution prevailed. There would be misery. There would always be misery, waste, and cruelty. She had never pretended to be changing the human condition, to be mama, taking tragedy away from the children so they won't hurt themselves, anything but. So long as people were free to choose, If they chose to drink fly bane and live on the sewers, it was their business. Just so long as it wasn't the business of business, the source of profit and the means of power for other people. She had felt all that before she knew anything. Before she wrote the first pamphlet. Before she left Pahel. Before she knew what capital meant. Before she'd been farther than River Street where she played a role taggy, kneeling on scabby knees on the pavement with the other six-year-olds. She had known it. And she and the other kids and her parents and their parents and the drunks and the whores of all River Street were at the bottom of something. Or the foundation. The reality. The source. The way you drag civilization down into the mud, cried the shocked, decent people later on. And she had tried for years to explain them that if all you had was mud, then if you were God, you made it into human beings. And if you were human, you tried to make it into a house where human beings could live. But nobody who thought he was better than mud could understand. Now, water seeking its level, mud to mud, lay a shuffle through the foul, noisy street, and all the ugly weakness of her old age was at home. The lacquered hair arrangements dilapidated and askew, the one-eyed woman wearily yelling her vegetables to sell, the half-wit beggar slapping at flies. These were her country women. They looked like her. They were all sad, disgusting, mean, pitiful, and hideous. They were her sisters, her own people. She didn't feel too well. It had been a long time since she had walked so far. Four or five blocks by herself in the noise and push and striking summer heat of the streets. She wanted to get to Coley Park, the triangle of scruffy grass at the end of the Tamiba, and sit there for a while with the other old men and women who had always sat there to see what it was like to just sit there and be old. It was too far. If she didn't turn back now, she might get a dizzy spell. She had a dread of falling down, falling down and having to lie there and look up at the people come to stare at the old woman in a fit. She turned, started home, frowning with effort and self-disgust. She could feel her face very red and a swimming feeling came and went in her ears. 
got a bit much. She was really afraid she might kill over. She saw on the doorstep in the shade and made for it. Let herself down cautiously, sat inside. And nearby, a fruit seller, sitting silent behind the dusty, withered stalk, and people went by. Nobody bought from him. Nobody looked at her. Odo? Who was Odo? Famous revolutionary author of the community, the analogy, etc., etc. She. Who was she? An old woman with gray hair and a red face sitting on a dirty doorstep in the slum, muttering to herself. True. But was that she? Certainly it was what anybody passing her saw. But was it she? Herself any more than the famous revolutionary was? No, it wasn't. But who was she then? The one who loved Tavir, yes, true enough, but not enough. That was gone. He had been dead so long. Oh, am I? Leia muttered to her invisible audience, and they knew the answer and told it to her with one voice. She was a little girl with scabby knees sitting on the doorstep staring down through the dirty golden haze of River Street. In the heat of late summer, the six-year-old, the sixteen-year-old, the fierce cross, dream-ridden girl, untouched and untouchable. She was herself, indeed. She had been a tireless worker and thinker, but a blood clot in a vein had taken that woman away from her. Indeed, she had been the lover, the swimmer in the midst of life, but to very dying had taken that woman away with him. There was nothing left, really, but the foundation, and she had come home. She had never left home. True voyage is return. Dust and mud and a doorstep in the slums. And beyond at the far end of the street, a field full of tall, dry weeds blowing in the wind as the night came. Leia! Leia, what are you doing here? Are you all right? One of the people from the house, of course. A nice woman. A bit fanatical and always talking. Leia could not remember her name, though. She had known her for years. She let herself be taken home. And the woman talking all the way. In the big, cool, common room once occupied by tellers counting money behind polished counters supervised by armed guards, Leia sat down in a chair. She was unable, just as yet, to face climbing the stairs, though she would have liked to be alone. The woman kept on talking, and other excited people came in. It appeared that a demonstration was being planned. Vince and Thu were moving so fast that the mood here had caught fire and something must be done. Day after tomorrow, no, tomorrow, there would be a march, a big one, from Old Town to Capitol Square. Another nine months uprising, said a young man. He had been born at the time of the nine month uprising. It was all history to him. Now he wanted to make some history of his own and the room was all filled up. And a general meeting would be held here tomorrow at eight in the morning. You must talk, Leia. Tomorrow? Oh, I won't be here tomorrow, she said brusquely. Whoever had asked her smiled, and another one laughed. Oh, Mai glanced around at her with a puzzled look. They went on talking and shouting. The revolution. What on earth had made her say that? thing to say on the eve of the revolution, even if it was true. She waited for a time, managed to get up and for all her clumsiness, slip away unnoticed among the people busy with their planning and excitement. She got to the hall, to the stairs, and began to climb them one by one. General strike, a voice, two voices, ten voices were saying in the room below behind her, General strike, Leia muttered, resting for a moment on the landing. Above, a head in her room. What awaited her? The private stroke. That was mildly funny. She started up the second flight of stairs one by one, one leg at a time like a small child. She was dizzy. 
she was no longer afraid to fall on ahead, on there. The dry white flowers nodded and whispered in the open fields of evening. Seventy-two years, and she had never had time to learn what they were called. 